conductive wire And you were so electric I had no say when you came so near And just passed right through me Hey everyone, welcome to Geekdom is Back, as is Drew Deitch. We are talking all about the TV series Nosferatu, which is based off of Joe Hill's book by the same name. So Drew, I want to kick this off by quickly discussing the book because I haven't read it. I believe I have it sitting on my Kindle waiting for me to read it, which is the story of a lot of my books. They are waiting to be read. <laughs> <laughs> but have you read you the there. book? Yeah. Uh, I think this was this was either the first or second Joe Hill book I read. I can't remember if it was this or Horns. Um, I think it might have been Horns. And, and I, okay. I loved Horns so much. And this was before I even knew that he was Stephen King's son. It was just, oh, this was the, you know, hot kind of horror book going around. And then looked into it. I was like, oh, he's yeah, that's Joe Hillstrom King. Uh, so then uh, Nosferatu, or I, at the time I was always calling it NOS 4A2, was, I think, had come out relatively recently and picked it up from the library and read it. And, and I liked it as much if not more than horns and ever since then i've been pretty pretty dedicated to you know keeping an eye on what joe hill's doing but i haven't read the book since you know it's been years now but i was very very happy to hear that it was going to be made into a television series um because it was definitely a story that i felt couldn't have been done the best justice as just a single feature. Um, the book is takes place over a pretty wide period of time. Uh, the lead character, Vic, she actually starts in the book very young. I want to say like six or seven or something. Okay. When she first discovers her, her ability uh, and then it goes through when she's a teenager and as she grows up and uh, some other stuff, which, you know, I don't know how spoilery will get, but I'll hold off on that kind of stuff that happens in the book for now because I think it'll inform where the, the show might be going. Um, but yeah, the, I, I, I highly recommend the book. And as far as comparing the book to the television series, they've they've made a lot of key changes but I think the spirit of the book and the kind of the big ticket items are there and they're doing a really good job of adapting. Yeah, personally, I first read Heart Shaped Box from Joe Hill and then I started to dive into Lock and Key. I've been wanting to read more of his books simply because one, he doesn't have nearly as many as his father at least not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt like they would be a little easier to get through. And I've bought some of them and just haven't gotten around to reading them yet. But with the first season of this being over now, I was like, okay, maybe I should really try to read the book before the second season comes, which I don't believe will be happening until at least sometime next year, just because mm -hmm. it was just announced at Comic-Con in July that there would be a second season. Yeah. So... One of the things that I liked about the show, though, right off the bat was my familiarity with most of the cast, I would say. I'm honestly not super familiar with Ashley Cummings, who plays the lead, Vic McQueen. But, you know, you just have this supporting group of actors who have been in things that I've watched recently. You know, both of Vic's parents were in Marvel's Netflix shows. One was in The oh, Punisher. Okay. One was in... Uh, I forget what the other was in, but that's what I recognize them from, basically. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, I I'm, I'm not familiar with uh, the majority of the cast. I mean, maybe it was like, ah, eh, maybe they kind of look familiar, but not enough to pinpoint what they were from. Except, of, of course, uh, kind of the big get in the cast was Zachary Quinto as, as the antagonist Charlie Manx, and that yeah. was when that was announced. I was like, okay they're doing something very different than the book um, because I believe, and, and again, it's been years so that this may be wrong, but in the book, Charlie Manx stays a certain age. Um, yeah. He's just kept alive by what he's doing. Um, he does not de-age 
uh, throughout the story. But that that's something that they do in, in, in the show. And I'm like, well, it makes sense. You got Zachary Quinto because you want to show off Zachary Quinto. And I'm sure it's expensive to keep him in old man makeup all the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's, it's an extensive process. So um, but th- that's that's one of those kind of changes where I'm like, I have no problem with that because it's a change that makes sense. It's like, oh, that's a visual way to represent how his powers act to the audience. So it's like, oh, and and you get to see Zachary Quinto, and and I'm always game for Zachary Quinto, especially when he's playing villains. I just think he's a really good heel uh, actor. Like, yeah, he, he, he's just so good at it. He's got a great face for it, and. <laughs> Uh, you know, and and he you can just tell he's the kind of person that relishes being a bad guy. Yeah, I loved his performances in American Horror Story, especially when he was the villain. And there's a transformation video for how they put all of that makeup on him and everything. It's time lapse, so it's not too long. I'll link to that in the show notes. And I apologize. It was not both of Vic's parents who were in Marvel Netflix shows. It was her dad and his new girlfriend, Tiffany. So oh, okay. two of them, one the dad was in The Punisher, and the actress who plays Tiffany was in the latest season of Jessica Jones as sort of just this character actor. And the mom I had recognized from Sneaky Pete. So there's just a bunch of things I had watched recently where I was like, oh, all of these faces are looking familiar. Even the actor who plays Bing, and I'm not even going to try and say his name because I will probably butcher it. (laughs) He was in something I had watched recently. So to see all of these people coming together in this way, especially for a horror show, I was like, okay, I, you know, I think this is going to go over very well. Yeah. It's a really, really solid cast. And I think what's so important about that is even though this is a, a horror show, the casting is important because a lot of the season isn't centered around the bigger kind of dark fantasy elements. It really is about Vic's life and how she's dealing with her parents who are, I I love this in in the show. And and this is present in the book where it's like Vic's parents aren't like, they're not heroes. They're not villains. They're genuinely flawed human beings. Right. And neither of them seems particularly good at parenting you know you can tell her mom (laughs) is definitely working just to be able to keep up with the bills and everything but she also doesn't really want to let Vic go and do her thing despite her at this point being a senior we see her going around looking at this design college in Rhode Island if I'm not mistaken and she just wants to have this life of her own outside of this small town and her dad seems more willing to give it to her, but at the same time, it's like he kind of just wants to not have to deal with anything, it seems like. It's so interesting that they really decided to focus on this aspect in the show, because if I remember correctly in the the book, uh, Vic's dad just up and leaves and is gone from the story for a long time. Okay. Um, And then re-enters at a later point, but... I liked that they were going to focus on Vic and the relationship specifically that she has with her parents, because that's a really important one. And if if people are watching the show and they're like, I came here for the kind of, you know, crazy horror, dark fantasy stuff, and I'm getting a lot of parental drama stuff and and I'm not liking that. I'm like, that's that's what makes it good. Like, I, I like that. It'll often be because of a fight that Vic has with her mom that she decides to go off and use the shorter way bridge. It's good drama and conflict uh, for the characters because I I definitely can see an issue people have with this first season being uh, in regards to the pacing. Um, And this is where the kind of adaptation element comes into play because the this is all taking place when Vic is a senior and she's going out and and all of this is happening kind of all at once whereas in the book because it's it it goes on for I think a few years when she finds this shorter way bridge and you know runs into Maggie she's maybe 13 or something um 
And I want to say she's like 15 or 16 when she finally encounters Charlie Manx. So the first half of the book kind of deals with her childhood into adolescence and, and being a teenager and everything. And it it feels a little more natural because they had to, you know, condense that and have it be, we, well, we have to have a single actress, you know, who right. can play Vic for, for the entire run of a show. Let's make her 18. Let's condense all this. Um, so it, it feels a lot more kind of, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's very TV acceptable. Um, but I think if the pacing is an issue that people might have with the show, I definitely recommend checking out the book because I think that's an issue that's solved there. Yeah. And it's totally understandable that they wouldn't want to have, you know, three different actresses or even two different actresses playing Vic McQueen because mm -hmm. that's going to eat into your budget and maybe you'd have less money for some of the visuals that they pull off here. And we're definitely going to talk about those in a bit. But what I love about the story is that it's obvious Charlie Manx goes after kids whose parents kind of ignore or neglect them. And while Vic has her problems with her parents, a lot of it stems from her parents fighting with each other not mm. necessarily that they don't care about her, because you can tell they do. They just each have their own way of showing it. And, you know, when you're a teenager, I don't know if you can name me a teenager that hasn't fought with their parents <laughs> at all. So oh, in course. this, that comes off a little less expected, I guess you could say, because it's like, okay, I understand why Charlie Manx is going after, you know, the boy in the beginning and then the girl that Vic goes to see because you can tell Vic's kind of keeping an eye on her and mm -hmm. she doesn't have the best home life. But then Vic's old enough to where you're like, okay, well, she's practically an adult or is an adult technically if she is 18 instead of 17. But I was just like, okay, so then they're making her like the queen and you have this dynamic where she kind of understands how all of those kids feel. But at the same time, why would she want to go with Charlie Manx? And there's so much tension between those two characters and what Vic wants to do with her life versus what, I guess, fate has in store for her. Well, one of my favorite things about the book and that the show is doing really well is I, I think a major theme that Nosferatu is exploring in terms of horror is the fear of growing up is the fear of adulthood. Um, you know, you look at Vic's parents who are have stunted their growth in their own particular ways. Um, Charlie Manx's entire lifestyle uh, is about taking children away and taking to them to this magical place, Christmas land, where they will never grow up, and in turn, he will never age. Um, it's this idea of why are we afraid of being adults? You know, the responsibilities and how, you know, messy and awful life gets the older you become. And I, my favorite thing about the story is wrapping that all up in this idea of Christmas, because Christmas mm -hmm. is this thing that symbolizes, you know, a, a season of eternal youthfulness. You know, it's, it's in the dead of winter when things are, you know, dying and, and everything, but it's this, hope and joy and all this kind of stuff, kind of ignoring the horrors that are going on outside by creating this festivity uh, that is very youthful. Um, I, I have kind of a weird, uh, I won't say obsession, but I'll, I'll, I have a weird interest in things that take the idea of Christmas and use it to explore darker things. Um, I think that's always a really interesting kind of, flavor to add to a story and that's i mean that's why i was so surprised that this was a show that you know started airing during the summer mm -hmm. and it's like oh I, I would have thought they would have saved it for the winter when you know christmas is going on but it's not so much a show about christmas that's just a, a theming in there um but but i love all of the uh christmas land things and i know when, when you talk about when you talk about uh visuals and, and effects and stuff like that uh they dole out 
the Christmas land stuff very slowly in this season. Yes. To the point where it's, it does get to like, okay, I really want to see this. Like I, now that I know that this is a thing, I really want to see Christmas land. And they did some things that I'm, I'm <laughs> surprised they, they pulled off as well as they did that are in the book. For example, Charlie Manx's face being on the moon in Christmas land, which is such a creepy little detail. It's it's wonderful. I actually think that as far as that's concerned, they spent their budget really, really wisely. Yeah, because along the way, we're kind of getting closer and closer to Christmas Land, and it takes several episodes before we really see what that is all about. You know, even Bing is kind of being strung along almost in the same way that the audience is, because he's doing all of these things for Charlie so he can get to go to Christmas land. And then he's left at the gate. And then you're like, okay, we want to know. Bing wants to know. Everyone wants to know what Christmas land looks like. And they do a really nice job of building that up so that when they do reveal it to you, you're like, oh, okay, this is why they had us waiting so long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, that's, if that's an issue, that people have, I recommend they check out the book because it's it's divided much more perspective wise into just switching between Charlie Manx and and Vic. Like they're really mostly the only two per- perspective characters in the book. Um, we do spend time with Bing Partridge, who in the book is is pretty much the way he is in the show, except for the big difference being that in the show he knows Vic and is friends with her. Um, that's a completely new addition. They they have no former connection uh, in the book, but I liked that addition in in the show. It added a di- a different layer to their relationship and made Bing being Charlie's manservant kind of more tragic uh, for Vic, which I thought was was cool. Um, but yeah, the 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 show. The show, I think, does a good job of laying out its mythology because it is it's a weird mythology that you have to explain to the audience. The idea of inscapes and, you know, what how they work and strong creatives and this history. I like that they, you know, dive into more and more history. For, for example, the episode where we see uh, Charlie Manx's proposal uh, to Jolene. And her getting away on her skates and seeing what her inscape is, that's, mm-hmm. as far as I remember, completely new. And I loved that episode. Yeah, that was very well done. Yeah, that, that was one of my favorite episodes. And, and because this is a TV show and they can stretch things out, I see that they were very interested in playing with bigger ideas in the mythology. Because uh, in the book, there is a moment where I think it's Charlie Manx, somebody opens up a map And it says, you know, the inscapes of America. And they did that in the show. And I was like, oh, cool. And you see these little, you know, points on the map. And it's like, oh, that's a reference. You know, there's like Pennywise's Circus. I even think there's a a reference to Lock and Key about like the town of Lovecraft. Okay. So and, and that's in the book. And I was like, oh, cool. And then they did that in the show. And I was like, that'll be it. That's cool. But then there was the episode. I I can't remember. I think it's episode eight. Uh, Parnassus, where there's kind of this inscape bar run by this guy, Abe, that apparently Charlie Manx knows. That is yes. not in the book at all. Okay. And and that, that threw me for a loop. I was like, what is this? Okay. And Parnassus seems to be some kind of hangout for the, the worst possible people that use inscapes. And I haven't even been able to look up all the different references because Charlie Manx goes into the Parnassus bar and there's all these people there and they all immediately leave once he shows up because they're all scared of him. And the most obvious one is some guy dressed as a clown. So you're like, Oh, that is that Pennywise? Is that a reference (laughs) to Pennywise? Um, But there's also a guy that appears to be Freddy Krueger. He's wearing the exact same sweater, uh, but he's, but he's not burned yet. Um, and there were some other people that, that, you know, I was trying to look up the Easter eggs for, and I was like, oh, this is cool. Like this is, 
again, it's little Easter eggy stuff, but I liked that idea of expanding the mythology and really playing with it. And, and that's something I'd honestly like to see the show do more of. Yeah, I didn't even think to look that deep into that scene because I was so fixated on what charlie and abe were discussing that i was Mm -hmm. like oh okay whatever they walked into a bar everyone left because they're scared of him kind of thing so i'm very glad that you caught that it makes me want to go hop on shutter after this and like try and pause (laughs) before everyone leaves and see who else is there but there are also a ton of relationships between various characters in this and obviously vic is going to have the most ties because this story is revolving around her and Charlie Manx. But one in particular that I really want to talk about is the relationship with Vic and Bing, because it's clear that she's the one person who has kind of been nice to him. They share comic books and she goes by and finds out where he lives, not necessarily intentionally, but then As soon as Charlie comes into the picture, everything flips and Bing is manipulated so easily. You would think that once we find out about his history, he wouldn't want to be manipulated by someone again. It's like, okay, this dude literally killed his parents because they kept telling him what to do and, you know, yelling at him, degrading him, whatever. And that's pretty extreme. But then he just kind of slinks away every time Charlie Manx gets mad at him. Well, it's I think it's feeding into that theme of stunted childhood of, you know, Bing is another stunted child in in a very, very tragic way um, and a very disturbing way. And I think it, it goes to show that his his obsession with Christmas, you know, the fact that I think they mention it in the show, but obviously they are able to expand on it in the book a little bit more about his name is even, you know, a reference to Christmas. You know, he's named Mm -hmm. Bing after Bing Crosby and Partridge, you know, Partridge in a pear tree stuff. So he has this really deep affection for the idea of Christmas. And, you know, he sends off the, the ad uh, that Charlie Manx puts in, in some comic book to, get an assistant to be in a, 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 you know, an assistant for Christmas land or whatever. It's like Christmas is used as this kind of idea that captures the child in all of us for, in this case, the worst possible reasons. Um, and Bing's idea of Christmas land, you know, Christmas land being the ultimate perfect happy place um, where he'll always get to be a kid and where, you know, all these kids, have been taken to. Uh, and I, I think the most important moment in terms of Charlie and Bing's relationship be, is when Charlie takes Bing to the graveyard of what might be, which is this graveyard inscape with basically these souls of kids. And it's their, it's really the souls of their childhoods that were taken from them because of their parents. And Charlie, you know, shows them all these kids and then he shows him Bing's you know, soul and says like, I was, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to save you, Bing, but if you help me, we can save all these other kids. And it's, it's a great, great scene in in the show and Mm -hmm. in the book, Um, especially as the show goes on and we see it's like, yeah, Charlie Manx has no care for Bing at all. He's just manipulating him to do these things that he's not able to. So I love that. I really like the relationship between Charlie and Bing and even, you know, that Bing, challenges Charlie at certain times, you know, not being able to go to Christmas land or does things that might make him mad, but, you know, always wants to stay on his nice list. I I think, I think the back and forth between them is some of the best stuff of the first season. Yeah. I was mostly a little disappointed with how quickly being turned against Vic, given that she was the only person who was really nice to him. You think that relationship would have maybe had more of an effect on him than it did just because he clearly lived kind of out in the middle of nowhere off the beaten path and he didn't really want people knowing where he lived but he was willing to you know have this friendship with Vic even if he was the janitor and she was a student and you could tell that there was something there just connection wise and obviously not in any sort of romantic way, just in a friendship kind of way. And 
that almost instantly felt like it went out the window when Charlie was like, oh, you can just help me. Vic is a bad person kind of thing. And you could see Bing struggle with it a little, but Charlie was so persuasive that Bing couldn't really think for himself. Well, I think that you can you can attribute that to Bing's past and his relationship with his mother, because he, he not only kills his mother, he has very, uh, very disturbing uh, feelings towards his mother. And this is another theme in the book and in the show, which is I'm, I'm glad that they're tackling it, is the theme of misogyny. Um, Charlie Manx is an outright misogynist. He oh, hates yeah. women. Mm-hmm. And and he's definitely imparting that to Bing, who had this very, very textbook kind of exaggerated Freudian relationship with his parents where, you know, his father was dominating and he wanted to kill him. And then he assaulted his mother. And when that didn't go so well, he ended up killing her, too. Um, so I think with the relationship with Vic, you know, she's, you know, either a goddess or something far 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 worse uh and and those are the only two options so with vic as soon as vic realized who bing was and and saw him for who he was and called him out on it she was immediately kicked off the pedestal and uh i i again that that was an aspect of the book that i thought might get lost in translation be, because the book is directly dealing with misogyny um but they didn't they they incorporated that very directly and and i liked that i mean going back to that scene with abe and uh charlie in the parnassus bar abe is somebody who's clearly uh, has fed charlie's misogyny you know saying something to the effect of you know uh you know, you need to kill this woman that you're interested in this Vic McQueen, because nothing good ever came out of being, you know, focused on a woman. Like it's, it's very clear that this hatred of women and the, the moralizing that Charlie Manx and Bing both have towards women is a huge part of the villainy that informs their characters. Yeah. And I like that Vic is still able to have at least Craig on her side at all times. And you can tell that she's kind of torn between wanting to be there with him and wanting to go to RISD and sort of experience this life outside of this town. And even once Maggie comes into the picture for Vic, you get these stronger relationships with friends or love interests for Vic that far surpass anything she has currently with her parents or any of the adult figures in her life. And once Bing turns on her, she sort of can try to bring him back. But I think she knows that he's kind of past the point of return because Charlie has brainwashed him so much. And Charlie, despite how old he looks most of the time, He has this insane amount of power, and Vic is still trying to figure hers out. And Maggie is sort of this guiding light for her, in a way, even though there's still a lot of darkness within her character as well. So you have so much darkness with all of these characters, pretty much. None of them have fantastic lives. And I think that is what makes them so interesting, with the exception of maybe a couple characters like the rich kids who kind of have everything. They might not have the best parents in the world, but they still have these advantages that Vic doesn't. So you can see why she would want to be close with those characters, but at the same time, she ends up pulling away from them because she feels like the outsider in that group. Yeah, the the romantic kind of the the love triangle that they had to create for Vic with i can't even remember that bland rich boy i think it was drew maybe not 100 percent sure maybe uh i feel like i would i should remember it if it was that but um you know i don't think that character or craig are in the novel again because this part of the story kind of takes place in the book when vic is much younger right so so that's not really kind of the the big thrust 
of her story at that time in the book. Uh, I, I liked Craig. Like, Craig is, I mean, he was making Jaws references and stuff like that all the time, and that was something <laughs> that, you know, that that him and Vic share, and I was like, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's going to work for me. That's cute. Um, and obviously, he ended up, you know, kind of getting roped into the the finale kind of uh climax and action and stuff like that Mm -hmm. he he was the one who got damseled and vic had to save him like oh that's nice um but yeah i i i have to say that that was one of the one of the parts where it's like ah it feels kind of like you know one of those adaptation necessities where we're like we need something more because we got to fill 10 episodes so let's throw these characters in and they're not bad, but I think that they detract from the bigger thrusts of the story and not just the horror fantasy stuff, the relationship between Vic and her parents and things like that. It's like, I, I'd rather focus more on that stuff than, you know, like by by the end of the season, you know, Rich Boy doesn't even matter. He's out of the picture. He felt like a throwaway character by the end of everything. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he really was. And, and I don't foresee him being a factor in the show going forward at all. But another element of the show that I think it's talking about the, the, these characters that have these different abilities, Um, you know, we, we haven't talked about Maggie a whole lot, but but you mentioned her, Mm -hmm. you know, hers is her, her Scrabble tiles that, you know, can kind of answer any question you ask them and sort of, you know, she got to unscramble the answer. And um, she kind of lets, Vic know the rules about inscapes like you have to have a knife that's your object like my tiles are my knife your bike is yours Charlie's is is the wraith um and but she says the the term that she uses for these people are strong creatives and I think the story is also a story about being a creative person and kind of the tolls that go along with that these powers sap the energies of these people. And that is why Charlie Manx has found a way to become kind of a, a psychic vampire of sorts and stealing children away is that's the only way he's able to replenish his life force. Um, because these powers take something away. They, they, we see that with Jolene's character. Um, when Vic gets admitted, uh, to, to that, um, hospital uh, and she runs into Jolene and Jolene shows her, you know, okay, this is how these things work, but they drain you, you know, they're going to take your energy. And eventually if you keep using them, they will kill you. It's like, th- this is talking about people. I think artistic people who are compelled to be creative people, that it's not something that they can just switch off and kind of, that gives them a unique power, you know, their imagination and their talent and everything, but it comes at a cost. Yeah, you can tell that this is really having an effect on Vic because not only does her eye get totally bloodshot and really just to the point where you're like, is that even safe to be walking around with your eye like that? To <laughs> the fact that she can't sleep and just has this compulsion to draw kind of what she's seeing in her head, even though Mm -hmm. it's something that hasn't played out yet. And you see later with Jolene, and she has been so doped up that her creativity has just been stunted for so long. And Vic has to come along to kind of wean her off of the drugs and just really get that creativity back long enough for Jolene to show her the way. And that creativity is so core to who these characters are that without it, like Jolene, they kind of just become nothing. And that's why Maggie and Vic are kind of like, okay, you have to go after the Wraith, which is unfortunate because the Wraith is so pretty. I love that car. Um, You know, it's a, it is a real model. You know, I remember reading up on it when I read the book and it's like, Oh man, if you were going to pick a car for a villain, what a perfect car. Uh it's such a a wonderful old school design. I, I love the interior of that car and I, I'm not a car person mm-hmm. and I I adore that. And I like that it is in a way a character um yeah. in the show, 
you know, it, it acts of its own at times. And because I, I like that they make the connection that, well, the Wraith really is Charlie Manx, which is also in the book where it's like you have to destroy it to destroy him. So if you puncture the his, you know, fuel, you know, it's it's going to affect him. If you mm-hmm. start burning it, it burns him. Uh, I, I thought all of that was so wonderfully well done. Um, and and I, I really I, I like the way that they show off all the different powers it's it's a simple visual trick but i love every time maggie sticks her hand into her scrabble bag yeah like and it just goes you know all the way up to like her shoulder and you're just like oh that is because that's they they say that specifically in the book it's like her hand goes in you know like way way farther than it should be able to and it's like oh it's such a bizarre image to see every time i love that and and Maggie is is very different in in the show. I think she's well, not quite, but a little little older in the book. Okay. And she's not somebody that's kind of palling around with Vic. Vic kind of sees her maybe two or three times her entire life. And it's just she uses the shorter bridge, goes to Iowa. Maggie tells her, you know, okay, this is your abilities and stuff. And I was told about the Wraith and that you're the only one that is going to be able to find him and stop him. But and then I think Vic visits her when she's much older and, and Maggie is completely, you know, lost to dementia and stuff like that. OK, so they 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 deeply have expanded her character and made her much more central to the story. And I believe much younger than what she starts off uh, in, in in the book. But I like her. I like her being a part of the story. I like her being somebody that Vic can kind of bounce dialogue off of and, and talk to about her problems. I I like when uh, Vic is kind of like, I'm done with all this Wraith stuff and everything. I'm going to go to a party and Maggie tags along to the party. Um, I thought that was really, really great. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I really liked the first season quite a bit, but looking forward, uh, I and knowing what I know about the book, I don't know if this is a show that needs to go beyond two seasons. Yeah, based on where they left off, and since I haven't read the book, I don't know how accurate this is. It felt like they were kind of in the middle of the story because you have all of this background with these characters, even Charlie and Vic, and we don't need to see them as their younger selves. Obviously, with Charlie, we get that more just because he changes into his younger self throughout the first mm-hmm. season at times. But by the end of the 10th episode there, I was like, okay, I feel like they've kind of gotten to the point that they want wanted to get to in this first season. And then the next season will sort of just wrap everything up and I'm planning to read the book in between seasons just to sort of get a better idea of these changes you've been mentioning throughout this episode Mm. and to see where season two might take things given those changes that they've already made. Obviously, they're probably going to try to keep a few people close to Vic and who knows what's going to happen with her parents because that just seems like a lose-lose situation there. But I'm really excited to see how they have everything progress with Vic and Charlie in particular. Well, uh, I'll, I'll say, you know, to, to your listeners, some kind of light spoilers for the book um, without giving anything directly away. The ending of this season where Charlie Manx, you know, wakes up, that is, I believe, the very first chapter of the book. Oh, interesting. It starts now. And I think in, in that he is uh, dead. Like, I don't even think it's him in a coma. I think he might actually be considered legally dead in the beginning. Okay. And then it flashes back to Vic as a kid and, and gets going. Because the second half of the book follows Vic as an adult. Um, I mean, it's been... A significant amount of years since she encountered Charlie Manx. The the phone calls that were in this season where the kids are calling her from Christmas land and like taunting her and saying like, where's father? We're so hungry. That all happens afterwards in the book 
where, you know, she believes that she has killed Charlie Manx. Um, and these, you know, kids from Christmas land continue calling her. And of course she's the only one that can hear it. She, yeah. And they did that in this season where she keeps hearing the phone ring that nobody else can hear. So it's starting to drive her crazy and she's trying, you know, supposed to be on medication for this and, and all this kind of stuff. And the second half of the book, you know, examines her life as an adult. Like, I want to say she's like 30 or 40 in the book um, during this section of the story. And obviously they're not going to do that in the show, <laughs> um, you know, with, with, with the actress that they have. Uh, so they're going to have to find a different way because there's a lot more stuff going on in the book. Uh involving where her career goes, um, her, uh, eventual partnership, which I, I don't, I don't want to spoil anything there because it is, um, there's something that was, that was set up in, uh, at the end of the season. So yeah, I, I think for season two, a, f- a few things that I'd like to see are actually things that aren't in the book. I would, and I know that there was a, a a comic that Joe Hill did. I think it's called Wraith. Okay. That was kind of Charlie Manx's origin story, like from him as a kid all the way up to where he is in the book. And I'm like, I I'd like to see some of that utilized for the show because there's still littler parts of Charlie Manx's past that I think. You know, like like seeing him as a kid, seeing like where does his misogyny come into play mm-hmm. and who is Abe to Charlie? Like was is, is Abe kind of an adoptive father to him? You know, is Abe basically Charlie's Maggie, like the person that he taught him what an inscape was and how to use it and all this stuff? Because clearly Abe is somebody who's not aging, not dying. How is he using his inscape to do that if these things are, you know, used to to drain people and and kill them? So I'd like to see a little bit more of that. Uh I'd also like to see and I have to imagine this is the plan, a full-on showdown in Christmas Land. They go to Christmas Land, you know, a couple of times in this first season, but yeah. if I if I remember correctly in the book the showdown does happen in Christmas land. Like Vic is there and she is, as she keeps saying in the first season, like I'm going to find Christmas land. I'm going to burn it down. Um, that is really the big thing that we all want to see happen. Um, so I hope that that is the natural kind of ending that the show is building to is like, we're going to spend like at least three episodes or something in Christmas Land, Vic is there and her final kind of showdown with Charlie Manx. Um yeah, I I've I mean I've really liked the show so far. Uh I, I hope if nothing else it's inspiring people to read the book. Um but I I I'm also okay if it was like, yeah, it's just two seasons and that's it, because it's not really a story that needs to go on indefinitely or find a way to kind of unnaturally stretch itself out yeah it's like yeah i mean if if it went three seasons uh, and that was it i'd be like eh, maybe like I'm, I'm sure you could find some stuff to do but really at least looking at the book for inspiration it's kind of like it's not definitively split in half but there's kind of two very clear halves of the story mm-hmm. and i'm like yeah i think you can tell that with 20 episodes and have something that's pretty good I really hope this show doesn't overextend its stay because sometimes you get these shows that are so good for, you know, let's say three to five seasons, but then they end up going seven or eight seasons and you're like, okay, I know you guys want to make as much money as possible, but sometimes (laughs) you're doing the story such a disservice by just going after those paychecks. And obviously with this being adapted from just one book, there's a more definitive story that ends Mm -hmm. in that book. And I really wish that with adaptations like this, they would just keep it to, you know, a season or two, just do a limited series and leave it at that. Yeah. I, you know, it's interesting. I think it's all dependent on 
your premise. Like mm-hmm. you look at a premise like The Walking Dead. That that is a as far as a premise goes, something that is designed to last forever. Yeah, to go on and on and on. <laughs> yeah, and and that is not in 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 my opinion, like this is not a blanket statement by any means, but in my opinion that's often not the best approach to storytelling. Like as far as stories go, I think you should have kind of a goal in mind. And with so many shows, I think because of their success or because of the nature of their premise being so malleable, they can, you know, bloat themselves and and that they can go down avenues that may not exactly work to their benefit in the long run. And then you'll have, you know, people discussing about, oh, there's this season of this show that I just really don't like. And, uh, you know, uh, it was so unnecessary. And you look back and it's like, yeah, because if you look at the the bigger picture of the grand story, that arc wasn't really that impactful to, you know, the, the big picture. Um, and with a show like Nosferatu, it's something where I think the cast of characters is actually relatively small enough that it doesn't have a need to keep bloating up and get like, like in all honesty, there aren't many more, if any more characters that I think the show needs to introduce. Yeah. Um, like it's got its cast. They they introduce one very important character towards the end of the show, and that's that's Lou Carmody, the the biker that um picks up Vic. Um, he's the only other really important character in the book, and it's like okay, he's there at the end, and when he showed up, it was like oh, okay, I there. This is a seed that's being planted, but otherwise, there's nobody else. Like I don't need like you know Vic's aunt that we never met to suddenly come into the picture or something like that it's like nah i don't i don't need that (laughs) i'm I'm fine yeah that's all good by me like the the only new introduction of characters is kind of the brand new stuff they've created where it's like oh yeah they they invented craig but then you know spoilers they they killed him by the end of the show which i was like okay and that was that was good because mm-hmm. that was important for Vic's arc. Um, the creation of Abe for Charlie. I'm like, that's great. That seems like a good seed for a reason to explore a little bit more of Charlie's origins in the second season. But otherwise, it's like, nah, you've got your cast of characters and no need to go beyond that. And if I'm not mistaken, Joe Hill was relatively hands on with this. I know on IMDb, he's listed as one of the series writers for 11 episodes now and it does say based Mm. on the novel by as well so i don't know if they're just saying that he's getting credit for all of those episodes because they're based on his novel or because he actually contributed to you know the writer's room for it yeah i don't know his direct level of involvement i know he's been very um very vocal obviously about promoting it and Mm -hmm. has been in a lot of the kind of uh, EPK stuff that AMC has done, yeah. you know, kind kind of out there. So I I don't know as far as if he was directly involved in the writers' room. You know, he's he's as 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 much as I know, he's not you know in any kind of show running capacity or anything like that. He's obviously a, a producer, I believe, on the show as well. But um, you know, I I definitely think that considering as of when this is recorded. This and Horns are the only uh, pieces of his that have been fully adapted for, you know, film and television. And the Horns movie was, it was okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the book was much, much, much better okay. um, and very different. But uh, I think this is one where it's like, okay, he's he's got some kind of oversight, even if it's not incredibly heavy. And I think he seems very, very happy with the finished product. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, I certainly hope that he's enjoying it and what they're doing with it. And I, I really, really hope that it's that season two, they announce it because the only thing that they didn't say about the season two announcement was that, okay, this will be the final season. Yeah. Like we're just going to do two seasons. Um, I'm, I'm sure they don't want to say that for, for a new show, Um. But I'll be I'll be a little worried because 
I'd rather them say season two is the final season. We wrote it that way. Like we wrote it going into an ending rather than they make a season two thinking they might get picked up for season three. And it ends on, you know, a, a, a note that is not conclusive and then they get canceled. Yeah, I'd say overall, though, I really enjoyed this first season. And maybe that's because I didn't have the knowledge of the book behind me to notice all of the differences. But I thought it was pretty well done. A lot of the visuals looked really good. And AMC typically has a very good quality with their shows. You know, I watch Preacher Mm -hmm. and I've watched some other AMC shows. So I was very happy that this is where this show ended up. And I think AMC is also more inclined to stop shows after X amount of seasons. Like I believe Preacher's only four seasons and it's done. Mm -hmm. So you have this precedent where they aren't going to necessarily take the story further than what the creators have in mind for it or the people who are adapting it have in mind for it. So that is pretty hopeful. But again, overall, I had fun watching this and i Hope I get a chance to read the book and possibly even rewatch season one before the next season comes out. Yeah, I, I after the season was over, I was like, man, I really want to read the book again. Like, <laughs> it, and and I think that's that's a testament to how good this first season is. It's not. Yeah, it wasn't a like, oh man, that this was so bad that I want to read the book to cleanse myself. You know, with all the differences that they made, nothing nothing was so catastrophic that I felt it broke the spine of the story or the characters i was like no you know i see why they had to do certain things and some some things i wasn't crazy about you know but but most of it it was it was fine but at the end of it i was like man i want to read the book again before season two comes around because i just (laughs) i want i want to live in that story again i want to be with these characters again and and i think that's a, a good sign um and and it's a good looking show too. I mean, like mm-hmm. you say, you know, visually, uh, AMC is very dedicated to to making very cinematic television, and Nosferatu is no different. You know, it's 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 not quite as prestige level as I think the stuff that people associate them with, as far as you know, the Breaking Bad shows and and even stuff they've done recently, like The Terror. But I think it's it's a very 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 good looking show for what it is and. And I'm sure it's kind of destined to be pigeonholed into horror stuff because of its creator and kind of the stuff. But I'm like, if anybody out there is kind of averse to things because they're like, oh, it's horror, it's scary. It's like, eh, this is, I, I I align more with kind of the dark modern fantasy moniker okay. for this. It Like, it, it's, it's horror. I'll call anything horror. It blends but I'm like, both. Yeah, but it's. Yeah, it, but but it's not, you know, like jump out, scare you or, you know, tons of gross out violence or anything. It's like, no, th- there is a really cool fantasy mythology being built here with these characters that I think would interest more people if they knew the show wasn't just what they think a horror show is supposed to be. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think that's a perfect note to end this on, Drew. Thank you so much for coming on to talk about this. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'll definitely have to have you back on for season two and even the book if you want to go more in depth on that, if you get a chance to reread it. Yeah, if we both get a chance to read it, uh, (laughs) I'm, I'm more than happy to. Awesome. Before we go, I just want to quickly let you all know about our Patreon for a dollar a month. You can support the show and get a thank you. On the podcast, for $2 a month, you can get a Chat Cemetery sticker. For $5 a month, you can pick a topic for this podcast in specific, and I will have to cover it. So that's a good way to support the podcast. If you can't afford to do that, just tell a friend about it, and that works too. You can find us at Geekdom Pod on Twitter and at Welcome to Geekdom on Instagram and Facebook. As always, thank you all for listening, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.